Hello, I'm Dawn Westmoreland, hailing from Asheville, North Carolina, the beautiful Blue Ridge Mountains, hailing from WPVM LP FM 103.7, which is the Voices of Asheville. I have a weekly radio show that's syndicated on Pacifica Network. You can listen in every Thursday at 4.30 p.m. to 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time Zone if you're listening in at the time it's aired or any time that it is streamed. Right now, all over social media, we're hearing about Afghanistan and the Taliban. And so it's bringing light and awareness more to military people, military matters. But today I have Scott Deluzio, who's coming from Arizona. And Scott was in the Army five, over five years, five and a half years. He's an Army veteran. He also has a podcast, which is called Drive On, and we had an early discussion about what is Drive On. It's an Army term. It's kind of like a metaphor, don't give up. Well, I'm retired from the Air Force. I never heard that. What a great metaphor. Also, Scott just put out his first book. It is called Surviving Sun. We're going to get into that. Scott, good morning, good afternoon, depending on when you're listening in. How are you? I'm great. Thank you for, very much for having me on the show. Oh, what a pleasure. What a pleasure. So you got out of the Army in 2011. I did. And yeah. you have a little and, bit of a story. So I'm going to let you jump in and share that story. Yeah, sure. Absolutely. So uh, th thanks again for, for having me on. And so my story is, um, you know, I, I joined uh, in the post 9-11 era. I joined uh, largely because of what was happening in Iraq and Afghanistan and, and the wars that were be, being fought over there. And I joined at a time when the army recruiting numbers were, they were struggling to, to meet their numbers. And I, I was watching the the news and I, and they were talking about how, you know, they, they weren't going to meet their, their recruiting uh, goals that they had set. And, um, and, and that sort of bugged me. I, I said, you know, what happened to the uh, the people of September 12th, 2001, who were so patriotic and they were so, you know, ready to just jump into action and, and take charge? And I said, where, where were those people just a few years ago? They were all over the place, but where are those people now? And then I had a good long look in the mirror and I said, well, I'm young enough and I'm healthy enough and I have no reason not to join. So, so why not? So, so I, I was like, you know what, I'm, I'm going to do it. I'm going to sign up too. my, my younger brother had just signed up the year before. And uh, so I had a little better idea of what I was getting myself into. And uh, so I, I decided to join the, the military as well. Um, fast forward a few years, 2010, uh, I was deployed to Afghanistan. Uh, my brother, my younger brother also was uh, deployed at the same time to Afghanistan. Uh, and we were both uh, infantrymen. So we, we saw some combat over there and, and we, uh, we, we had our fair share of, uh, you know, the, the battle that was going on over there. And um, un unfortunately, uh, you know, later on uh, in that deployment uh, in, in August of 2010, uh, he was killed in action. And so, um, uh -huh. so that's, that, that was kind of, uh, you know, you were talking a little bit about the book before that, that I wrote, that's where the title comes in, uh, surviving son. And, and, uh, you know, so, so that's kind of, uh, you know, my, my background, my story a little bit in a nutshell, but I'm, I'm sure we can dive into more details, uh, you know, as we, as we go on here. And I, I feel it's important to honor and elevate your brother's name. Can we get his name, please? Yeah, sure. He, uh, I, I should have mentioned that before. He, he his name is uh, Sergeant Stephen Deluzio. Yeah, so he he was uh, he was killed August twenty second, two thousand ten, uh, in in Afghanistan um, with the he was serving with the Vermont Army National Guard, and uh, you know our, our my unit uh, it was in the Connecticut Army National Guard. He was in the Vermont Army National Guard, and we both were attached to the same brigade. So we, were, we the whole brigade got deployed deployed at the same time. And so we were both in country at the same time. Um, you know, I was fortunate enough to, to be able to escort his body out of Afghanistan to Kuwait, um, you know, where, where we parted ways and, and I continued on my way home. Um, but, you know, he went through the processing that, that uh, the deceased usually go through, um, you know, over the next couple of days. So, um, so that, that was hard to leave him behind, but it was, uh, you know, it was good to get back home too, so. Yes, and, and I must say, you know, I was a casualty um, superintendent in the Air Force, and I, and I imagine that must have been very difficult, rough, um, being a part of bringing your brother home. Oh, it was. Yeah, um, I, I remember. So the, the day that uh, he was killed, um, I got I got pulled aside uh, by by the, our commander. And, and so I was a 
E5 sergeant. So anyone who's familiar with the military, that's that's not high up on the totem pole, you know, as far as the command, the chain of command goes. Um, and so when a commander comes directly to you, that that's that's unusual. Usually they go through the chain of command and 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 don't don't necessarily go directly to you. But he he came straight to me and and said, you know, I need to talk to you. And so I, I'm th- starting to think I did something really wrong, <laughs> you know. But um, then he he told me about my brother, and and that was that was just a, a terrible situation. Uh, but to to make matters worse, uh, about 20 minutes after finding out about my brother, our our unit started getting attacked uh, by by the Taliban as well. And so you know we started taking RPG and small arms fire and 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 things like that. And and so I had to set my grieving aside because I was in charge of uh, several people, uh, you know. And and I I needed to make sure that they didn't get hurt or killed and that they had what they needed and and so I needed to put my my own personal issues aside and and go straight back into army mode and and take care of my guys as well you know and also you know make sure that my parents didn't get a second knock on the door telling them that their their other son was killed as well you know if something happened to me so I had to kind of get my head on straight for for that that moment as well you know. You know, and to our listeners, let me share with you, if you're not familiar with enlisted people, enlisted people are the backbone of the military. So Scott is definitely was the backbone of the army. He was in a position um, that was very vital and very important. So fast forward, you got out in 2011, correct? Yeah, and right. then about two year, two two and a half years ago, you started this podcast called Drive On. Don't give up. Yep. That's what it's about. <laughs> What's yep. that intention? You're out there helping veterans. Let's share your podcast and what it's about. Yeah, no, absolutely. So the podcast Drive On uh, podcast, it it's all about that that army. Uh, Mod, uh, not motto, but the, the saying that we have in the army of drive on, you know, when something is hard or difficult, don't, don't give up, just keep, keep going at it, keep working at it. And, and don't, don't quit on yourself. Don't just don't quit in, in general, you know? So, um, and, and the reason why I started it was because, so the company that I served with over in Afghanistan, we, we were very fortunate in that we didn't lose anybody uh, overseas to, uh, you know, any casualties in, in my company anyways. Um, and, and so we were very fortunate in that regards. But when, after we got home, we started losing people to suicide. And that was a, it, it was, it was hard for me to, to, to understand, like, we were over in a place where people actually wanted us to die. And we didn't do, do that there. But then we come home where people want us to live and thrive and, and be happy and, and everything else. And now we're losing people. And that just didn't make sense to me. And, you know, I, I looked around like, what are the resources out there that, and, you know, I, I knew everyone knows about the, the VA, the veterans affairs, and, and they're doing the best that they can with the resources that they have available. But, you know, the, the resources are limited and the need is, is great. And there's a lot of other resources out there that quite frankly, a lot of veterans just don't know about. And so sometimes they, they will go to the VA and they maybe won't help the way they were hoping that they would get the help or, uh, they didn't qualify because maybe they were discharged, uh, you know, dishonorably or or something along those lines, and sure. and so they're not they're not qualified to get uh, care through the VA for for one reason or another. There's there's a mul- multiple number of reasons why you may not be qualified to get VA care, um, and they may just feel that there's no options for them and that they have no hope and there's there's nothing out there for them, and so I I knew that that was wrong. And I wanted to tell people, but you know, how do I tell the most number of people possible? And so I decided to start a podcast. And and so what I do is I talk to other veterans who are struggling, who have struggled with with something, um, you know, be it uh, transitioning from the military to civilian life, you know, dealing with with uh, civilians in their new civilian job, uh, things along those lines. It could be any number of things that people are dealing with, PTSD stuff like that. Um, and I talked to them about them to how they they came out on the other side better for, uh, you know, the, the situation that they were in, um, you know, and what they did to, to walk through those steps and, and, and find their way out on the other side and, and basically give hope to the veterans who are going through similar situations uh, who might be listening or, or their families or their employers or friends, you know, whoever might be listening. Um, and, and to just give hope that, that you don't want to give up 
and, and you do want to keep driving on, you know, that, that, hence the name of the, the show. Um, but I also talk to other people who provide services to veterans. So uh, they might be alternative forms of therapy that may or may not be offered through the, the VA. So it could be things like uh, art therapy or uh, equestrian uh, therapy where they, they use horses to, to kind of help uh, the veterans because the, there's not a one size fits all approach to every situation. We're all different. We're all unique individuals. And, and one person may resonate really well with painting or some sort of artwork like music or uh, you know even baking or, or something along those lines where, where it's therapeutic for them and it, and it helps them. And other people might respond better to, you know, in person, you know, like your traditional, uh, you know, therapy sessions, a talk therapy, that type of thing. And, and everybody's a little bit different. So I want to be able to provide all the options to people that, uh, that listen to my show so that they know that there are plenty of options out there. And if they think that they've tried everything, they haven't, <laughs> there's a lot out there, you know, so, so that's, that's kind of the, the podcast in, in a nutshell. And, and thank you, Scott. It's so commendable. And, you know, I've been retired from the Air Force 16 years. I hear it all the time. Veterans just don't know what's out there. So kudos to you for doing your podcast and letting people know that you're helping them with transition from not just the Army. Are you covering other branches, too? Is it just for the Army or? All branches. All branches. Yeah, we cover yeah, cover everything. Nice. The only only branch that we haven't had a, as a guest on the the uh, podcast yet is the Space Force. So if anyone listening out there knows anyone or is affiliated with the Space Force, please feel free to reach out. I'd love to have you on. Um, we've had <laughs> everyone from the the Coast Guard, Army, Navy, Marines, nice. uh, Air Force, the the whole whole works. The only thing is just not the Space Force. So I'd, I'd love to have have uh, some representative from there uh, come on the show. So I'm curious, you know, because you know, I've been in the field of HR myself, oh my gosh, over 30 years. And when I was in the Air Force, I was personnel, which they same thing as HR. What do you know to be true, Scott, about transitioning from like, let's just go with the army, you know, you your sure. infantry, and now all of a sudden, how does that translate into the civilian world? Well, you know, one of the things that I've noticed. And it's a very common thing amongst veterans. And it, it I, I say common because it's not a hundred percent. There's not, you can't paint with a broad brush and say like every veteran's gonna have this problem, but it's a common thing where, where veterans who get out of the military, they're missing a few things in their civilian life that they had in the military life. One of them is the camaraderie. Um, you know, when you're in a unit with, sure. with, uh, with various people, you get to know them intimately like you know you know their 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 parents names and you you hang out with their their family sometimes and and you like you know their issues you know it, and it's not like the civilian world where it's like oh i'm not going to talk i'm not going to bring my personal problems in it's like we talk about everything and we we know each other personally and and we we hang out and we we've got each other's backs and and we're we know that we can rely on those people but when you get into the civilian world it's not always the case that, that you're going to have that kind of support network. Um, you know, a lot of times, especially in, in the corporate world, people are looking out for themselves, their own advancement in their own careers. And they're not really as concerned about e even their subordinates, you know, are they advancing in their career or are they doing all that they, they should do, or are they just okay where they're at and, and just keep them there, you know? And so, so camaraderie and that, that sense of belonging, uh, is, is one of the big things, but, um, but also a sense of purpose. Um, you know, when you're in the military, it's, I mean, I, I, I don't know that I've done anything more meaningful other than uh, getting married and having kids uh, than, than being <laughs> in the military. And, um, you know, th those, those things are, you know, being, being in the military and serving something that's bigger than yourself is, is huge. And it's a big sense of meaning. And for some people, it's the only job they really knew since they graduated high school you know they, a lot of people get in into the military when they they turn 18 and, and you know right after high school and they they go in the military they serve 20 30 years whatever it is and and then they get out and then they they get into the uh the uh civilian world and that sense of meaning and that purpose is is just gone and you know you might think that that your company has this big bold mission statement and it's it's serving all the these different things but it's it's probably not as big as serving your country and putting your life on the line for your country 
Yeah, unless you're probably you know, unless, unless you're a uh, person, uh, police officer or fire department. Uh, yeah, you're probably not doing that that type of thing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know, any any of those uh, EMTs, anything like that, they all are out there putting their lives on the line uh, every day for for other people. And and you know, if your job now is sitting in a cubicle, uh, you know, from nine to five, where you're, the worst threat to your life is a paper cut you're probably not going to feel that that same huge immense sense of purpose and belonging um not necessarily belonging but a sense of purpose and, and that meaning uh in in your work so so it takes some some adjustment for a lot of uh military uh people getting out of the military and getting into that civilian world to kind of reframe their their thinking and and, and think about what they're doing in a different way you know it's maybe it's not as big as being in the military but it's it's a, a different sense of purpose you know you're you are serving a bigger uh a bigger picture and if all you're seeing is this little sliver of what you're doing then you know maybe it's it you're not getting the whole big picture so so i mean there, there's ways to you know kind of coach those those uh veterans who who might be working for you to to help them understand the bigger picture and and help them feel like they're they're contributing to a bigger uh bigger cause you know you know, Scott, in the Air Force, it was always called service before self. And you're saying it in different language. Did the Army have a saying also? Yeah, we. I think it was it was very similar to that. It was a selfless service. Um, you know, so that was one of the the, the Army values that that we had. And 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 so selfless service meaning, you know, uh, I'm going to do this thing whether or not it's in my own best interest. You know, it. it you know, look at the um, you know the people who just whatever it was a, a week or two ago when they, they came home, uh, you know, under flag drape uh, caskets and, and oh. they were, they were, they definitely put themselves or, or put the mission before themselves. You know, they, they ended up giving their lives for uh, a, a bigger cause. Now I'm not suggesting to any civilian employers that you're putting your, your, uh, uh, your, your, employees in harm's way intentionally just to make them feel like they have a sense of purpose. That's not going to cut it. Like that's not, that's not what we're talking about here, but, but those people, they have it ingrained in them that they're willing to sacrifice themselves, whether it means sacrificing their, uh, their free time or sacrificing, um, you know, their, their own well being. they're willing to do that they've already proved it by the fact that they, they came out of the military and that they've done, you know, whatever it was that they did in the military, uh, just signing up for the military, you know, volunteering during a time of war is, is a pretty selfless act in and of itself. Um, but, you know, we're, we're, we've proven that we're willing to sacrifice ourselves and our own well being, And, um, you know, so it, it's just something that, that it gets ingrained in you, uh, you know, early on in the military. Yeah. Hey, and if you're just listening in, I'm your talk host, Don Westmoreland, the Empowered Whistleblower Radio Show. And every week I talk about workplace issues. I'm talking to Scott Deluzio, who hails from Arizona. He is a military army veteran. He's written a book, Surviving Son. He has a podcast called Drive On, which is all about hanging in there, keep moving forward. So we're talking about military veterans transitioning. So what are some of the hardest things for military veterans when they transition that you've noticed, Scott? Yeah, it, I, I think the hardest thing is just relating to the civilians that they're, they're dealing with in their day-to-day life. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, they, they, they struggle to find a, a job that has a, a, that sense of meaning and purpose, like we, we talked about a little bit earlier. But um, you know, relating to civilians, I think, is, is a hard thing, too, uh, for for them to, to really do, um, you know, they, they might find a job that they absolutely love, but they hate the people that they work with because it, because they just don't seem to fit in. Um, I, I talked to a veteran of a few weeks ago on my podcast. And, um, and one of the things that he said was that he had a, a bunch of friends from, from high school and college before he went into the military and they sort of grew apart a little bit, you know, they kept in touch here and there, but you know, they, they didn't really interact too much while he was in the military because he was always traveling around and everything. Um, but then after he got out of the military, he settled back down, uh, you know, near those people and he tried to get back together with them and he found that they had nothing in common. And the, the way that he talked and the way he joked about things was way different than how, how they would 
uh, talk and, and, and joke sure. about things. And, and sometimes it might seem like the, the veteran is a little uh, rough around the edges and, and abrasive with how they talk about things. You know, some of the uh, you know, dark humor that we, we use, it's, it's almost a coping mechanism, I think, for, for a lot of veterans. You know, we, we use that dark humor to get through some of the tough times that we've gone through, especially people who've been deployed, who've seen hor- horrific things. Um, you know, the dark humor is just uh, what we use. And, and uh, you know, I, I, sometimes I'll, I'll find myself slipping into that too and, and coming up with a joke that maybe is pushing some edges and, and people just look at me like, like, what are you talking about? Like, that's, that's a terrible <laughs> thing to say. But, you know, the other veterans who might be there, they're cracking up at the same time. So, so there's just like that, that balance that they struggle to find with, you know, who, who they were and who they are now and, and trying to come up with, with that. And, um, you know, it, it's something that I think is actually similar to, uh, you know, when uh, just related to the civilian world, when someone retires from their job that they've had for however many years, you know, their, their working career, let's say they're a doctor or a lawyer or something like that. And all those years, whenever they go to a cocktail party or a Christmas party or something like that, they'll, they'll say, oh, you know, what do you do? And, and they, they'll respond, oh, I'm a doctor. I work at so-and-so hospital and, mm-hmm. and, and whatever. And then all of a sudden they retire. And now what are they? They don't have that label anymore. And, mm-hmm. and, and so that's a big thing too, is just that sense of like identity and like, who am I? Um, and so, so you can, you can see how that, that doctor no longer is, is a doctor and, and it's almost like a light switch. You know, one day they're a doctor, they, they might be doing surgery or they might be, you know, helping patients or whatever. And then the next day they retire and all of a sudden, boom, I'm not a doctor anymore. Not that I'm incapable of being a doctor, done it for the last, you know, however many decades, but now I am just not that anymore. So, um, you know, the, the military is a lot the same way. Uh, you know, when, when people get out of the military, they, they lose that identity. And with my own story, when I got out of the military, um, I had submitted paperwork to get out, uh, to be discharged early. It was under an army regulation called the surviving sons and daughters. And, um, uh, so, I had to submit that paperwork and like any government, anything, it t- took a little while for that to go through. Um, but so one night I went to bed and I'm still a soldier. My identity, I still had that as I'm a, I am a soldier. And then the next morning I woke up and I got a phone call and saying my paperwork was approved. It went through and, and I've been discharged. And then it, w- it literally was like flipping a switch. Boom. Now I'm not a soldier. Like, what am I? You know, and I'm all the same things that I was before. I, I still was a father and a, a husband and, and I still, uh, you know, had, had my uh, civilian job that I worked at. And so I, I still had those things as my identity, but the big thing to me was being a soldier. And then it just got taken away from me and not, not that it was taken away. I, I asked for it. I, I knew that, that, that it was coming, but then it just hit me like a ton of bricks that boom, I'm, I'm no longer a soldier. And that was a hard thing to reconcile in my head it was, you know, like now, now what am I, what, what big thing is there for me out there? You know? Yeah. Cause I wanted to ask, and I know our listeners would want to know, you know, how did you feel? Did you, did you struggle through it? Um, did it take a while to process through it? You know, letting go of the army. It, it did. Um, it, it did take a, a while for me. And I think it was compounded by the fact that I had just recently lost my brother just a few min- months earlier. Um, and, and I was really struggling with, with that. But, um, you know, like I, I was saying earlier, when the day that my brother was killed, um, I literally was was plucked off of the battlefield um, by, by a helicopter and flown out. And then within two days, I was home. In, in the United States. And so I had zero time to decompress or, you know, like process any of the emotions or the feelings that I was going through after having literally just been in a war zone, you know, shooting, uh, you know, shooting back and forth, you know, and everything. And, and that, that is a hard thing to do. And so, you know, people do need time to process that. And I, I didn't get that. I didn't have that kind of time to process. And so I ended up dealing with, with it in a lot of unhealthy ways. You know, I, I, 
I, I couldn't sleep at night and, you know, having a young child at home, he, he was born just shortly before I, I deployed. So, you know, he still was not sleeping hundred percent through the night, you know, by the time I got home. And so that didn't help anything, but, um, but I, I don't think I would have slept all the way through the night anyways. And so that, that for me was, was a problem. And, you know, I, I wanted nothing more than to just sleep. So I would do anything I could, I, you know, between, you know, sleeping pills and, you know, maybe drinking too much and, and things like that, just so I would pass out and go to sleep. Like it, it wasn't, it wasn't the healthiest way. And I, I recognize this now, but it was, it was one of those temporary fixes that I, I, you know, it worked once. So why not? I'll do it again. And then, you know, when I didn't sleep all the way through the night, I, I try to fix it with uh, coffee or caffeine in the morning and, and drink that throughout the day and then more and more and more. And then that would make the problem worse at night where I couldn't fall asleep. And it was just a never ending cycle. And so for me, it was a really hard uh, struggle. And, and all of that stuff affected my mood, uh, made me, you know, more frustrated and more irritable and, and angry and all that kind of stuff. And it just, it, it wasn't a good situation. So, um, you know, how I, I dealt with it, um, you know, eventually when I recognized that there was a problem was I, I sought counseling. I, I went to uh, a place called the Vet Center. It's affiliated through the, the VA. And uh, they're, they're there for anyone who's uh, been deployed in, in any of our nation's wars, um, you know, who, who's gone, you know, all the way back you know, World War Two, or even, you know, any any wars in between, um, you know, you're, you're qualified, but it's also available to the uh, family members of uh, uh, service members who are killed in action. And so needless to say, I, I checked a couple of the boxes that uh, qualified me to go uh, to, to there for services. But, um, you know, talking about things and, and, and that type of stuff, going to counseling, it, it really helped. And, and I would really encourage people who are struggling to Check out those kind of services for for yourself because the there, there's been a stigma around mental health uh, treatment right. for quite some time, and you know there's there's no shame in help getting help for yourself and and working through your issues and and just talking about whatever it is that you need to talk about and and work through the issues and get get help. You know, I, I make this analogy like if you were diagnosed with cancer. Would anyone fault you for going to get, you know, chemo treatment or or whatever? Or if you broke an arm, would ever anyone ever, you know, look at you differently for uh, going to get a cast on your arm? Like, no, like that would be ridiculous. That that anyone would be like, oh, well, just toughen up and deal with it. Like that that's not what you do. Like if so, someone has a problem, you go and fix it. And so, you know, a lot of mental health issues, they it's just a problem that someone is having. And a lot of times they're they're very natural, normal reactions to abnormal events. And, and a lot of times the events that we experience while we're uh, in, the, in the military are very abnormal. You know, it's not normal to see, you know, people getting shot or blown up or whatever yeah. traumatic things. And, and it's, it's very normal to have these, these kind of reactions. So why not go get help, you know? Yeah. And let me jump in and say that our interview is almost over with time goes so fast when it's an interesting it subject. And so if your employer, um, you know, listening in and you have employees, Scott just shared a lot about how important it is for veterans to take care of their health and well-being and mental health should never be destigmatized. Um, and more and more people are out there bringing awareness to well-being and mental health. Scott, in wrapping up, thank you so much for being on the show. Tell us where we can find out more about your book, Surviving Sun, and also to catch your podcast and also to find you. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, the book is available on Amazon. Just search for Surviving Sun and, and it should come up. Uh, it's also available on uh, Surviving Sun Book dot com uh and it has options for you to, to buy it there it has a link to the amazon page too so if that's easier to remember surviving sunbook.com you can go there you can also get an, a signed copy if you are so interested I, I can do that for you as well um the podcast is available at driveonpodcast.com and uh all the social media for the podcast is uh at drive on podcast so instagram facebook twitter uh linkedin uh, YouTube, you name it, we're, we're there, uh, you know, posting all the episodes and, and things like that there. Um, and personal uh, Facebook and uh, Instagram social media, for me, it's all at Scott Deluzio. So you can check it out there. Uh, spell, Scott spell, S uh, Deluzio, just so everybody yeah, has I, it. I was just going to do that. Yep. So uh, Scott Deluzio is S-C-O-T-T, -T, so two T's, uh, and Deluzio, D-E-L, U-Z-I-O. 
Scott, you're awesome. Thank you so much for what you're doing for military veterans, but you're doing much more than just for veterans. You're helping their families, employees, employers. Thank you so much to the listeners. Stay tuned. Next week, we'll have another week uh, workplace issue and you stay empowered.